Hi, everybody. Welcome to our 3 o'clock presentation for Thursday on Global Hope. With us today, we have Jonathan Miller, who is going to be presenting for us today on It Depends on Where You Draw the Line. So, Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Smith-Meyer. So, as you can see, this is uh, it's, It Depends on Where You Draw the Line, um, which is also, aka known as, uh, How to Backtrace to the Future. Okay. So, what... I'll be talking about today. Uh, let's sort of talk about some vision. Uh, how to think about products and services. These are items, physical, um, non-physical, digital services, et cetera, um, that are all around us all the time. Our life is affected by, from the digital equipment we're using now to the presence of and the issues around, say, the police and protection systems that we have throughout our communities. And so these are all um, either designed by humans or sort of manifested with emergent behaviors. How you, how and who um, you have to choose around you is absolutely influential as to, to how you start to, to frame your view of the world. And so we'll get into that in terms of some of the, so my work on, on product development and entrepreneurship and, and how you can benefit from, uh, from thinking about the future and some hacks to do that. So let's look at, you know, some guiding questions. Um, how are organizations, particularly startups, which sort of my, my cup of tea, and I'm very fond of the power of a startup, how are these potential pathways to what we might call sustainable impact and empowerment? Sustainable, not just in the environmental, like, like uh, let's not use straws to, to choke tur turtles or something like that, but more in the sustainable in terms of being able to continue to generate new value for our communities. And finally, something to keep in mind in terms of vision setting is how could a moonshot vision help us to, quote unquote, see or have foresight into possible future or futures? Because if we can paint a picture of what the future will look like, then it really helps us to be able to rally other folks to, to sort of figuratively buy into that vision so that we can together create that better worldview. So some of the specific topics that uh, are coming down the pipeline. Uh, I'll talk about product service design, some examples and considerations around that, um, some aspects on team diversity, some tips in terms of uh, future thinking, thinking about these kinds of moonshots. And finally, something that helps bring it all together is entrepreneurship. So let's get going. Yeah, I, I guess you could say that, you know, the, Many presentations have a Venn diagram, and so here's here's my interpretation of one. Um, so for context as to, to where I'm coming from, um, I tend to work at the intersection of business, design, and engineering, integrating that those the three different domains um, and, and finding that sweet spot right in the middle. And over the course of this presentation, you'll sort of see more about what um, what that means to me and, and ways that uh, you can benefit from thinking in this way. In terms of some of the uh, sort of other parts of where I'm coming from, I do a lot of work in lab to market innovation and venture strategy. In terms of some of the highlights, um, ongoing mentorship on, on behalf of MIT for its Sandbox Innovation Fund, working with, with uh, young students, postdoctoral students, other members of the community in terms of helping, uh, helping to figure out what to do with maybe a cool technology that's coming out of a dorm room or perhaps one that's spinning out of a, a pristine uh, multi-million dollar lab. Completely different uh, sort of sources of these kinds of new technologies or new business ideas, um, but all brought together by the passion of the individuals that are coming to, to make that uh, come, to the, come to fruition. Um, and I currently do a considerable amount of uh, technical consulting work for Airbus Ventures. And um, so Airbus as in uh, a large um, aerospace um, developer and also for Alphabet X, formerly Google X, the so-called moonshot factory. And so I'm integrating these learnings um, into, into this, this presentation so you can see where I'm coming from. So we are uh, at all times a product of our times. For example, um, the US defense industrial complex is something that has developed over um, since the since before the inception of the United States, um, from the early days, say during the Civil War, where 
there were large, um, the government was asking for many large lots, say 5,000 lots of horses at, to help sustain the military activities that are needed. Um, and the, the challenges in contracting and identifying farmers who could provide that many horses. Um, and that contracting system has evolved into um, what we see, saw through the Cold War, many different types of aerospace companies, a lot of innovation, and then into the post-Cold War era, 1990s to present, where we've seen so much consolidation of defense firms, mergers and acquisitions. And so this, I bring up the, the U.S. defense industrial complex because it is absolutely one, um, it's just one example, but it's a very big investment and potential for, for uh you know, payoff in terms of return on investment in a dollar sense and return on innovation in a more figurative sense. Now, how does this affect our, uh, you know, our perception of startups and entrepreneurship and where we draw the line? Well, in terms of moonshot visions, um, there are the so-called unicorns of, of startup companies. A unicorn is a company that can generate or have about a billion dollars minimum of value. And in the past 30 years, following on from that set of defense industrial example I gave on the prior slide, in the past 30 years, we've only had three multi-billion dollar venture funded government oriented startups, SpaceX, Palantir, and likely very soon, Anduril. Now these all happen to be started by a billionaire, uh, billionaire folks like Elon Musk. What, what's in it for the, the so-called the, the, the little person, the small person who doesn't happen to have a billion dollars in the bank? What do we do? Well, it certainly helps to be drawing a painting a picture of a, of a moonshot vision that's worth other folks sort of investing in, in, into you, into your team. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to step one, because we all ultimately want to solve problems, right? At least a lot of us do. So let's look into that. Here's some ideas around why why we may be here. Um, we could be part of the system. We want to be, or we want to try to get ahead of the system, or perhaps even we want to uh, be leaders of that system. By being part of the system, that first part, um, it's we we see um, very pronounced lately, and but and globally inequalities rising, or at least inequalities that we thought may not have uh, have been as much of an issue are. Are end up being very latent and now popping up even more so, more on the on the social consciousness. And so we care about bridging gaps between populations and innovations. We care about people having um, their voices heard. We may also want to get ahead of the system. So you know, we talk about making sure like folks have uh, you know last mile internet access. Yes, that's absolutely important, um, but. Just merely having access to to the internet or to knowledge is not where we need to stop. It's it's more about ultimately about navigation. We care about people being able to not just react to things that they see, but to really to help create their own stories, their own narrative, as, and to help influence the direction that we're all headed toward. And finally, then that leads us to how we may be able to um, become leaders or pioneers in this system, envision the future is important because it helps to you to be able to set an agenda to ultimately figure out how what to do next to help build that future that you want. That's what we'll be getting into. So how do you challenge a designer? You know, uh, maybe if you think about a designer in terms of uh, the little D for design, uh, maybe um, a visual designer. Well, you can draw a line you know, figuratively uh, or literally draw a line and say, you know, keep, keep the car on the right side of the line. Do what you can do whatever you want. Just keep the car on the right side of the line. Designers thrive, however, when you give them that line and then they can find a way to make some creative use of it. I'm talking about design right now in terms of a, say a, a visual sense, but it goes beyond that in terms of system design um, and other forms of sort of architectures, how, when we have scope, then we have um, a target set and we can work within that scope to, to make the system better. So, you know, with so much of a, so many of us influenced by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us um, undergoing um, shelters in place, 
and economic hardship, perhaps, as part of that. This is a natural time for folks to be thinking about um, what they can, uh, a reflection of, of life. Uh, and sometimes, um, historically, we see that during these times of, of significant change is where there's a lot of opportunity um, for the creation of new products, new services, new companies that will become the titans of tomorrow. And so here on the screen, I, I'm showing an opportunity methodology that I and my teams have used um, to uh, considerable degrees of success. It's ultimately driven by empathy for the user. Empathy being the, the key word there, how to identify with the, the folks that you want to benefit from your, your invention or your new kind of product or service. We can walk through this, this uh, process here. It, it, you can see it kind of flows in terms of a, a clockwise rotation where we may start with expression, sharing what's, what we think is wanted, creating prototypes to make what's wanted. This could be like making, um, uh, I'll show you a little example later of making a drink coaster um, and then testing it to make sure it works. Um, so that's almost like the engineer um, behind it in, each, in all of us. And then we can get into exploration, discovering more of what's wanted. Is this, are we on the right track? Or are we not so much on the right track? And we go through the circle um, of expression, creation, testing, exploring. And eventually, as we get to the point of testing, once we have the, in the business, we may say product market fit. Um, and when you have that concept, when you, and you'll, you'll be able to sense it when you have it, then it's about implementation. How can we make lots of what's wanted because we're now finally um, starting to fulfill our vision of helping people. These are some examples and like a sort of tactical sense of different ways of going about that process to explore through observation, having empathy, expressing that through um, developing mission statements, personas, image boards, creating with the, you know, the, the um, ideas of how to generate concepts quickly, testing, and the implementation. I'll give you an example here. Um, this is the Muddy Charles development process. What is Muddy Charles? Well, uh, some time ago, Muddy Charles was merely two words um, and that, that didn't have any meaning. However, um, it's started, this is taking us back um, into uh, a spirit of something that we wanted to create. There was a small team of three, we'll get to those folks in a minute. Um, uh, a small team of three, identified with the concept of, uh, of Huga, um, and which is something that is a sort of a way of life, a feeling or a mood that makes, that helps you take sort of genuine pleasure in making ev ordinary everyday things simply extraordinary. Okay, so it's a, we have a concept, a feeling that our team wanted to achieve. How do we go about, and we were all based in Boston at the time, so we wanted to find a way to convey um, this, this, this sense of Huga. Well, we go through a process of creating mood boards, tactile feelings, personas. We made up a person um, based on user interviews of someone named Macy, who is a coffee drinker, a tea lover, probably, probably a hipster, um, and that she has these feelings of a ritual. So where's our line? Well, we're starting a small team of three. We're starting to get this, uncover through the dust, a sense of a line of who is like Macy, who has this pursuit of this appreciation for um, well-made pieces in his or her environment and a desire to have a story behind that well-made piece. That's becoming our line and in a, in a small sense, our, our moonshot. You know, as a team, we see the three individuals there, um, maybe one of them, what we did is we started to go down the path of brainstorming, um, concept art, design. This is the early stages of what would become Muddy Charles. Fast forwarding a bit, we started to do testing, we, pre we presented concepts, we made mock-ups, we got to something that became, in our view, beautiful on the right. We started to find that we had achieved the moonshot we wanted of creating something that would bring people together with a story um, for, in this case, for Bostonians, a tactile Huga kind of life. And then we began implementation, creating many more of what people, uh, what resonated with the people. Now, this is the this is a um, sort of end of that case, an example of 
um, one of the final pieces uh, that we had created. So that's walking you through that design of a product or service concept. That leads me to um, one of the points we want to talk about on team diversity. Now you see the folks on the right, you may see, okay, that there is, uh, if we look at some of the, the typical um, sort of almost little face value forms of diversity, whether it's um, shade of skin, um, to, different, the, what sex they are, what part of the world do they, from where do they hail? Um, those are some of the, the surface value ones, of course. Um, but diversity in terms of a team sense goes beyond face value, way beyond. And so how does it go? Well, our team was brought together. We have a designer, an engineer, and a business person of sorts. If you dig a little deeper, we have, uh, you know, actually it turns out the designer actually has business experience. The engineer, she actually had design experience. And well, the business, the quote unquote business guy uh, brought some engineering ability. Dig a little deeper. You know what? Turns out all three of us have some elements and appreciation for all three of those those concepts of business, engineering, and design. And just to make things fun, uh, the gentleman on the left was a rock star, like literally. Um, the woman in the middle, she races motorcycles. You may not see it from her, her petite demeanor. And uh, the fellow on the right, well, I like to run barefoot a lot. And so the point is, is that a diverse team is something that you, you can architect these, but you can't just do it necessarily from looking at people. It may help, it may not help. As you dig deeper, you'll start to see a lot of different points of view, hopefully, and also a lot of shared common interests and abilities. So bringing back that Venn diagram, business and engineering have been known to work together well for probably about maybe 80 years or so. That's, that area has been well explored in terms of academic literature and in practice in business. More recently is this idea of the importance of design with a capital D, why design should have a seat at the table. And we're seeing how um, the addition of designers are helping us to uh, both uh, figure out where we should draw the line and also how to draw beyond the line, to think beyond the line, because designers are very good about thinking how to create um, a new vision and, and communicate a new vision um, different than what we would have seen before. If you're, if you're interested in uh, reading more about that, I have, uh, go back a slide, um, is the, <laughs> is um, a book by a colleague, Steve Vassallo, called The, the Way to Design. Um, and so the, it's uh, thewaytodesign.com. Feel free to take a look at that um, if you're interested in some of these words and concepts that, that I'm speaking about. Now, let's go a little bit further in terms of exploring this idea of where we draw the line and ultimately how it's going to help us to uh, backtrace to the future. Some of you may have heard of the concept of five whys. It's a tool to help us figure out um, a root cause of something. Um, and it can be, it's often used in, in an engineering sense. It was developed by, um, as a part of the Toyota production system and is communicated to business folks and engineers um, as a result of that heritage. And this gets us into something, uh, you, know, you might have heard of the lean philosophy. Uh, take this, this quote here. It says that the basis of Toyota's scientific approach is to, ask five why, is to ask why five times whenever we find a problem. By repeating why five times, the nature of that problem is uh, as well, the nature of the problem as well as the solution becomes clear. So that puts focus on a problem statement. How do we identify a problem, a problem worth solving? And how do we start to figure out the cause of that problem? Because therein, and the cause of that problem helps us to figure out the solution where we need to draw that line. Here's an example. Five whys. We start with a problem. I ran through a red light. Okay, not good. Um, why did that happen? Well, uh, it's because I was late for work. This is, you know, coming back from the sheltering in place. Uh, just so maybe I'm off my game a little bit. Well, why, why was I late for work? Well, it's because I woke up late. Now, why did that happen? The alarm clock broke. Okay, well, let's push this further. The fourth why. Why did the alarm clock break? Well, I didn't 
actually check if it had worked. <laughs> um, and the fifth why. Why did, not check, why did you not check if it worked? Well, because I forgot to do it last night. And so therein is evidence of one form of our solution. Set a recurring reminder to test that the alarm clock is working each night so it's ready for me in the morning. Alternatively, I could set up a backup alarm. Maybe I use my phone. Maybe I should use a, a mechanical clock as well in case the power goes out. And so this is one example of a root cause analysis um, and, and the way of using the five whys tool. Now, this is five whys in sort of a, like an analytical, almost like an engineering sense. There are also other forms of why, like the meaning, um, why trying to find meaning. And so in my experience, strong teams are motivi motivated by uncovering why in the meaning sense. So why is a team investing time in this work? Why is each individual putting in so much effort? Well, on a strong team, uh, you may find that why, because they have pride in their work. They are professionals and they really love, or at least uh, can appreciate doing a great job for, for its own sake. Moreover, why? Well, because the problem sets are maybe interesting. And following on that, it could be because it's a problem worth solving, something that has that deeper meaning. And finally, um, a problem worth solving can be part of a bigger battle worth fighting. It's helping us to figure out what is that moonshot vision, that future that we want, and we backtracing to now to figure out where we need to draw the line, what's within scope, what's out of scope. So we can formulate this moonshot vision far ahead, backtrace to tomorrow, and there's some tools to help us do that. You may call it like future thinking, foresight, futurist field, um, and there's some other tools. We'll, we'll go through any, um, some of that, that tooling. Here's a, a, you know, with every diagram, there, there are limitations. This is a diagram of the so-called futures cone. Um, it's one way of many to think about how the future, you know, quote unquote, works. So on the left side, of the, at the narrow part of the cone is today. And we see there's kind of a, a realm as that cone expands as we move um, left to right across the screen. We get into the expanding realm of what is possible. That's the outermost circle on the right side as time progresses. Now, within what the, the circle that is possible is this circle or oval in this case, um, what is plausible and even narrower are some various elements such as what is probable like past performance is a pretty good indicator for future um, outcomes but there are it, there are ways to influence that you see that below the probable circle which is in blue it in blue color below that is our preferable preferable future it's somewhat uh it, it is intentionally arbitrary in this case but it may be that we don't like how our, our uniformed police system is working or not working right now. So we want to make it better for all of us. That's a preferable future. It may not be probable, but it's certainly plausible and absolutely possible. So let's go ahead a little bit further. Let's get a little bit more specific about this. Um, future thinking or foresight is that study, and it's, it's a, um, a, a school of thought of how to postulate what is possible, probable, and preferable. It's science versus art. It's past and present. It's working with these big, complex world systems. There are three groups among many who have experience doing this. One of them is Shell. Shell had uh, developed what may be kind of the, the modern view of, of foresight, you know, modern as in not like Nostradamus, way back when, um, but Shell, the oil and gas company, had developed a, a skunk work group, a small team that would think about, you know, what if, um, what if we find vast reserves of oil or what if we don't? What if, the, the, what if um, there are massive earthquakes? What do we do? They think about so much to build scenarios to help leadership think about what can we do to ensure we have options down the road. 
Steelcase, likewise, imagining the workplace of the future. Now, we'll see how Steelcase stands the test of time, almost pun intended, in terms of um, working with or the, the urge to work from home or need to work from home over the past several months and, and indefinitely in the future. Um, but they do work on foresight to help imagine future workplace needs. And finally, Alphabet X, formerly Google X, is, is um, fairly well known as being a moonshot factory to solve for X, where X is a variable, an unknown. And so with Alphabet X, many different projects across so many different kinds of fields and domains, often with some sort of a, an interesting technical advantage, either actual or hypothesized, to solve some big problem that only a company the size of Google or Alphabet could be in a position to solve. And so these future ideas and having that creativity to figure out where, how far we can push that line um, is absolutely um, useful and for organizations like this and many others. You know, it comes down to that, 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 that uh, two sides of personal and business. Personal, what, you, what will you be when you grow up? We've all asked ourselves that question. And on the business side, how can you lead with a what if question? How can you, that's a useful tactic um, to be able to help start to uncork some uh, interesting opportunities and discussions with your diverse team. So, you know, here's a little bit of a, an exercise in terms of that foresight. Imagine X, imagining and envisioning your first scenario. Um, you can think about it in terms of body, mind, and society. Those are sort of the three useful legs of this stool that we're building. The body, you may imagine a world in 2050 where people live to be 200 years in age. You know, that's not, 2050 may sound that kind of far off, but it's, it's, it's only 30 years. So um, what if we find, what happens if people start to live to be 200 years old? Um, what does it do for social security? What does it do for our friend networks? What does it do with how we choose um, to retire or not retire. The mind. Imagine a world in 2050 where you can transfer your memories to and from a computer. What would you do differently? We may, through our advancements in biotech, we may be getting closer to being able to replicate the brain protein chemistry that's in each of us to transfer consciousness. So then what? Is that a vision? Is that a, is that a uh, a future that we want and what part of it do we want and we can exert influence over that and finally with society imagine a world in 2050 where there's no government in some cases that may feel great in other situations uh, it may sound a little bit more like like mad max um, and so by looking at some of these extremes it helps us to think about critically about what's going on now and what we can do tomorrow figure that out to, to make it better. Let's keep going. Here's a laundry list of different kinds of questions. You, if you're working with your team and you're like, okay, well, I heard this presentation about like future studies. Um, the way that you can make use of what's on this slide is to give maybe 30 seconds, um, flash one of these questions up on the screen to your team. Um, and then every 30 seconds cycle through each new question and each team member on his or her own is, is rapidly trying to unfiltered, just writing or doodling um, what their response is to this kind of, these kinds of questions. Like um, in 2050, uh, where do you live? Um, what's the average temperature of the earth? How is food produced? What's it like to be nice in 2050? What does that mean? What do you have to do to be nice in 2050? What does the family unit look like? How do you learn? What does a hero in 2050 look like? Where do you go on holidays? So these kind of questions are a way to help you challenge yourself, your team, your organization to start to eventually, um, to build that future that we can then backtrace toward. Now that backtracing I've mentioned several times. Here's a um, sort of a, a 2D graphic that, that can be helpful for you to kind of like literally sort of map out um, on, on several different vectors. We have these um, eight different boxes here. Um, the, I'll start on the upper left. Arts and culture, spiritual, 
political, economical, environmental, sociological, technology, or technological, and science. And so um, across these eight different vectors, what we can do is posit a question, create the question that we want to work on during your future challenge, then scan that horizon across these eight different dimensions. These define your drivers. And then third, we're going to, so that, that would, where you kind of map out what the, in 20, 2050 or even 2025, what, what do you think the political environment was like, the economic environment, environmental. Again, these don't have to be, these are not supposed to be accurate. They're supposed to be not even probable. Um, the exercise, it doesn't matter necessarily what you choose as your political environment. It's the act of thinking through that um, and sufficiently different kinds of scenario developments that will be most useful for you. And so as you map out these different drivers, then we start to uh, do the backtracing where we're on the far extremes, the outsides of this horizon scan chart, we're going to, which is about the year, you know, 2050 or whatever you choose. And then let's start decrementing a decade, moving one decade into the past, AKA uh, one decade closer to where we are right now. As you do that, going to 2040, 2030, 2020, now, what we can map out, what needs to happen um, over each decade or otherwise unit of time to create that future vision on spiritual, spirituality, arts and culture, science, tech, etc., to create that world, what needs to happen on each decade to create that. That's the backtracing to the future. I have several case studies that um, I can uh, highlight for you that um, that I, I hope will be would be useful for you to see in some ways how we created um, new products, services, or concepts based on uh, coming up with some scenarios of the future and then figuring out, you know, okay, this is a future state that we think would be cool, useful, make people happy, save lives, whatever, and then figuring out what to do tomorrow to help make that reality. So the first case is White Feather Safari, the creation of a, a venture design group. The second is a project called Angel Eye for autonomous uh, vehicle systems and roadway intersections. The third is a project called Dimples, saving ink for companies that print a lot. And the fourth case is called Pipe Guard, a little robot that can detect where water or gas leaks. Let's look at first at um, White Feather Safari. White Feather Safari um, is, is um, a research group and a venture group. I'm talking about the venture group where we design products in the ventures to bring them to market. What's a venture, you may ask? A venture is a startup, uh, a small team that's wrapped around a, or wrapped within a company um, that could be one person, it could be um, dozens of people, um, and then and they are growing to, to try to create something that world, the world has never seen. So a process to, uh, to create these kinds of project company seeds is by working with hypotheses, kind of like the scientific method. You may, you may recall the scientific method is to establish a problem statement and then um, hypotheses about what's going on, and then a test procedure, and then performing those experiments, and then anal analyzing the results, make a conclusion. And that process, that methodology, is helpful to, to create, get answers. And likewise, with creating uh, tech, small companies, technical or otherwise, you could use a, um, an evolutionary approach to creating these concepts. In phase one on the left side here, I've depicted just through, through little circles, little um, gray, orange, or blue dots. These could be the seeds of problems that may be worth solving, that could be impactful in society if we were to work on them. That's the exploration phase where we generate hypotheses 
about how to about how the world works and how we may have a good solution that would be really cool to make. We can go through a calling process where we kind of filter, um, riff on different ideas, recycle ideas, make variants into these slightly bigger, more stout uh, seeds. They're starting to grow a little bit. These would be what we might call proto companies or proto co's. And we can, they're not named projects at this time. It's just like, you know, like protocol number 12, protocol number, thir protocol number 13, trying to solve different problems. As we go through feasibility testing, like do we, do we have the software expertise to do this? Is it possible with their artificial intelligence to, to solve X, Y, Z problem? Yes, no. Um, that helps us to down select ideas even further. Then we move into, uh, you know, after we've down selected to one sort of current project, it, if, it's, if it still survives, then we could graduate it to phase three, the new co, where it, it, start to, it starts to have its name and a bit of a identity to it. We incubate that internally, and if it can still continue to grow despite us trying to kill it, to figure out where its line is, where its boundary is, and push it beyond that boundary and see if it breaks. If, it's, if that idea refuses to break, then it can graduate into that fourth phase where it's a, a venture or a startup that would we could spin out externally. So this is a way to, to take many different ideas that you or your team may have and start to filter them down. You could rank them on desirability, feasibility, and viability. Perhaps that's DFV is common in, in um, product design in circles to be able to uh, filter ideas and to lead us to what is hopefully the, the best. I mean, this will help emerge the, the best ideas um, out of the bunch. So for some examples of, of the White Feather Safari Venture portfolio, um, we've got some of them listed here. You can see that they work across different domains. So what do I mean by domain? Well. Dimples is mostly software that saves ink for like newspapers um, and any companies that print a lot. Mad Dog Environmental Solutions is like a material science company to help for oil and gas waste stream protection to help contain the waste that comes out of oil and gas fracking so that um, it keeps groundwater safe for people to drink. Uh, Mighty Charles, we had talked about that as drink coasters. And then some of these other project products listed below. Um, I'm going to get into. Uh, I mean, what ultimately drives each of these is that focus on problem identification and scoping, which is setting that future vision. Then building the evidence for that by performing domain research and field observation, making sure this is a legit problem people are having or will have. And then third. Um, finding other folks to buy into that vision. And then we get into um, parts four and five, which is the backtracing part. Ideation, concept down selection, and as we start to build the future, going down the path of prototyping and implementation. As you may uh, start to get the sense of, is that if we have a, if we have a vision of, of a future that we think is great, and it's locked away in our heads, like our alone, our head alone, it's not useful, particularly because it's hard to get people to rally behind you. And so that's where the elements of the, the, the creativity of storytelling and use of varied media um, helps to get more stakeholders engaged in what you're trying to build. This is where it really helps to have a diverse team who, in t diverse in terms of thought and background so that they can find ways to, to communicate these stories outwardly. Now, as a result of part of that, what, that White Feather Ventures design process, the next three cases are, um, are, are based on that. This one um, on here is, is Angel Eye, roadway safety systems for, for folks from a, uh, like a bicyclist to a level five autonomous vehicle. Um, and so with this concept, it was, we use something called the human centered design or agile development processes to find opportunities in road safety. The future vision was, you know, what happens when we have 
stakeholders like I, like we have shown below, commercial drivers, um, you know, municipalities that are trying to just sort of make their collect enough taxes to 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 keep the lights on, um, you know, motorcycles, pedestrians who are distracted by their cell phones, private drivers, um, and cyclists, etc. Um, when you have all these folks working to or interacting in a, a roadway intersection, bad things can happen. You know, for a, a roadway cyclist, it's a it's a, intersections are like kill zones, and it's because of that danger, we were looking for ways to help build a a an intersection of the future that would make it much safer for people um, to 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 exist in. And, and still work within the, the advantages and disadvantages of higher levels of automation of our vehicle. So what we did is when we had that uh, a future vision set that, you know, it would be great if we could make something called, uh, could look down on top of that roadway intersections, get a, like a literal bird's eye view. Then um, we started to, we backtrace to figure out what do we need to build now to see if this idea has legs. Well, you can see uh, in a little, you know, sufficient detail, hopefully to, to get a sense of the different kinds of prototyping and testing that we did from renting a Tesla Model S to see how well its autopilot worked. Disclaimer or uh, note, it didn't work that well uh, to setting up object detection systems of roadway intersections. And this all helped to feed data into our plan. Um, to see if the future vision that we had for roadway intersection matched or was possible with the solution idea that we hypothesized. This is an example of the of a way of implementing it through through a a fixture that's attached to um, like a street uh, street lamp, for example. Um, I don't want to get into the technical details. It's um, the in in short, the project was a way for us to figure out what are the limits of what's possible with um, advanced computer vision systems, edge computing, and um, autonomous car systems, so that if we can exploit the benefits of all of those advancements in technology, it'll help us make the, world, the roads safer for the folks who aren't, uh, aren't like silicon-based, aka humans, who are just, you know, mostly wet wet puddles of, of bones and skin and stuff, how do we keep them safe through all of this? Uh, I wanna move through these, these next two cases. This, this case three is on, on a software system. The vision for this is, is we don't want a world without printed documents because printed documents seem to help our brains as humans be able to retain information better. Studies have shown that pr the printed page is uh, a much better way, reading printed paper, reading, excuse me, reading printed text is a much better way to retain information um, as compared to reading it on the screen. And so on that, uh, that vision that we wanted, printed paper to still be in existence, but to evolve with the times, uh, we hypothesized that, you know what, the, the line that we can draw in this case may be to make ink efficient text at making fonts that can save, uh, can save ink so that companies like um, regional newspapers, uh, magazines, high, high, high production quality magazines, and other entities can continue to print, um, but with a more sort of budget conscious disposition. I'm gonna hop through some of these um, since these are a little more technical than what we need to get into. Um, and so, let me move ahead to another slide in terms of the, the value proposition. Value proposition. This, we talked with customers throughout North America and Europe. And as part of that process, I highlight that because when building a new product or service where, you know, if you're doing something maybe sufficiently, you know, far enough in the future uh, or seemingly futuristic, a lot of people just won't understand it um, at the beginning because they haven't been thinking about this as as long or as deeply as you have and so that's where things like storytelling um, and 
visuals help to communicate some small sliver of what's what may be in your, your head or your team's head heads um, to communicate that to folks who would benefit from what you're working on. It touches on marketing. It touches on design with a capital D. It touches on business and engineering. I'm going to skip the technical slide here. Um, so in short, just to, to close the loop on the Dimples project, it was and is deployed across um, newspapers and print houses to be able to save ink, which in turn makes it so that we can save jobs for publishing companies. It was a vision we had, and it took years to, to you know, backtrace to today and start to figure out how to, how to create that future. Um, but it was largely successful, but a wandering path. You can't just usually get straight to the future. Um, not like in the movies, you have to work one step at a time. And that leads to this, the fourth and final case is um, a project called PipeGuard Robotics that we had um, in a slightly different than the prior cases where we had um, a new technology, like a, a hammer that was looking for a nail. We had a new technology that was doing something cool that could detect um, small amounts of pressure differences in liquid pipes, liquid filled pipes. Um, but we didn't know what that would be useful for. And so we started with a technology needed to find what future state would actually benefit from that kind of technology and when, what tweaks need to be made to it. We ultimately ended up, um, discovering through talking with many different types of folks from whoever has a, a you know, from, no, uh, from oil and gas to uh, water companies, et cetera, different ways of helping to, uh, to, to keep fluids where they're supposed to be in the pipe and set that vision that we wanted to make the Google map for, for water leaks. And so this technology was, we, we developed it over, over several years time, confirming through subject matter experts what was working, what wasn't working, um, I'm going to move uh, ahead here um, and then setting up timelines. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but on the left side, the one thumbnail there shows that we go from, uh, from year one through year six, planning how to, what we want, what we wanted to build and then figuring out technical and business roadmaps to deliver um, and, and steadily build toward the, the future that we want. We set a line Way far, in way far ahead to help drive the team toward that. And so those were uh, the, the main points I wanted to cover on this idea of backtracing to the future, that it depends ultimately on where you draw the line and there's, there's a variety of tools to help you. One of the, the best tool is to, to find folks who are willing to think creatively with you. Um, and they can become you know, future members of your team, a diverse team. And then you can help guide that team in terms of, of riffing on each other's ideas, having a safe space for creative ideas, um, so that as you go through that, that foresight process, such as asking those dozens of questions that I had listed on one of those slides, going through those in rapid fashion to figure out what is this future state that we that we A, want, or B, could have, that could be um, you know, favorable or disfavorable to your ideas, um, creating those scenarios and getting those stories put together so that then you can rally the team behind that vision while also communicating it to stakeholders. Um, that helps you to figure out where you wanna go and you backtrace to today so that you know what your next step should be. So. Thank you so much for your time. Um, that is backtracing to the future. Dep it depends on where you draw the line.